Good evening and thank you for joining us for tonight's webinar on Liverfluke. Tonight we are joined by Professor Diana Williams of Liverpool University who will be discussing some of her key research findings on Liverfluke over the past 10 years. After this webinar we have a live questions and answer so please join us then if you have any questions. Hello, so my name is Diana Williams, I'm from the University of Liverpool and I'm going to talk to you today about improving uh, liver fluke control. This presentation really contains information from our research um, programme of the last five to ten years, uh, which has been funded by the Biolog Biotechnology and Biological Sciences Research Council, Hibu Kid Cymru, AHDB, Quality Meet, Meet Scotland, and Ag Research Northern Ireland. Um, our collaborators were the M Modern Research Institute, um, SIUC, and the Centre for Ecology and Hydrology. And a lot of the findings from the research programme are fed out through COWS, uh, Control of Cattle Parasites Sustainably, and also through SCOPS. So fasciola, um, um, what is fasciola hepatica, uh, the common liver fluke? So it's a highly pathogenic parasite. Uh, it affects the health, welfare and productivity of cattle and sheep in the UK. It's a global parasite. It's found in temperate regions um, throughout the world uh, and also in the high altitude tropics. It's particularly important in this country um, as a cause of disease and production losses, uh, uh, particularly in sheep and cattle. Um, so the parasite causes acute disease. We typically see this in sheep in the autumn and uh, acute fasciolosis can result in heavy losses. So um, a sudden um, a death of um, often several sheep within a flock. Uh, chronic disease can affect both sheep and cattle. We typically see chronic disease uh, in the winter months, uh, January, February, March, that sort of time. Um, and it's, it's characterised by uh, weight loss, gradual weight loss. Um, the animals actually become very anaemic. So if you check the mucous membranes, the um, eye uh, con conjunctiva and, the, and the, uh, the gums, animals are very pale. And typically we can see uh, this bottle jaw, which is associated with an accumulation of fluid in the tissues, which is linked to that anemia. Um, so in addition to causing chronic um, actual clinical disease, um, fasciola can also cause um, production losses. So subclinical infections, so typically a lower um, flute burden. Um, than that required to cause disease can result in uh, really quite uh, significant production losses. So typically we see um, growth rates affected, so it takes longer for cattle um, to reach slaughter weight, for both steers and so on to reach slaughter weight, can affect uh, growth rates in sheep. Uh, in dairy cattle, it can affect, affect milk yield. Uh, and this is a, a particular problem, particularly for high yielding dairy herds, where the losses can be quite significant, up to 15% uh, reduction in milk yield. And these subclinical infections, infections can also uh, result in uh, uh, poor re reproductive uh, performance and so on. So it has, it has effects um, really in lots of different respects. So liver fluke is common. Um, it's the second most commonly diagnosed disease in sheep. It's also commonly di diagnosed in cattle and it's the most common reason for um, livers of cattle to be uh, condemned at the abattoir. The parasite is transmitted through um, an intermediate host, which is a, a mud snail um, called the dwarf pond snail. Um, and this snail, as the name suggests, likes to live in and around uh, bodies of water uh, and particularly on the surface of mud um, around the margins of bodies of water. So because of um, the need for, for wet conditions and mild temperatures, um, we're seeing that climate change is having a big impact on the prevalence of liver fluke. And our studies, as uh, together with studies from other groups, have shown that the projected climate change 
uh, predictions uh, over the next um, sort of few decades suggest that liver fluke is going to become even more of a problem than it is already. Um, we also think that things like changing farming practices have had an impact on liver fluke. So things like environmental stewardship schemes can actually create environment, the environment which, um, which is suitable uh, for the snail intermediate host. And these snails are tiny. Um, this is just the end of a, the tip of a, a small paintbrush and you can just see the snail here. So they're sort of mud coloured and they're sitting on the mud and they're very small. Um, they grow up to sort of five to seven millimetres, something like that. Um, so they are hard to spot. So given um, that fluke is common in sheep and cattle, how do we uh, control it currently? Essentially, control of fluke um, requires, um, is, sorry, relies um, on the use of veterinary medicines. Um, routine treatments and often blanket treatment of flocks of sheep or, 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 uh, or groups of cattle. Um, and there are a limited number of veterinary medicines available uh, which specifically target uh, liver fluke. So one of those products, um, a drug called triclobendazole, <clears throat> is the only product which is effective against all stages of the parasite, including the highly pathogenic uh, immature stages of the parasite. And it's these immature stages, the young stages, which migrate through the liver. Um, they eat uh, the tissue and destroy the liver. Um, and where you have very high numbers of the parasite migrating through the liver, this results in acute uh, fasciolosis and frequently death of the animal. So triclobendazole is the only drug which will kill those immature stages. So it's a very valuable drug. Triclobendazole is present in products such as Facinex, Combinex, Cydex and Triclomox, uh, Endofluke, Tribex, Triclofas, um, Triclocert and so on. Um, so any drug with um, either an X at the end or a tri at the beginning, it probably contains triclobendazole. So work that we've done um, and published recently suggests that resistance to triclobendazole is highly prevalent in England and Wales. So we in, um, contacted and tested uh, about 72 farms, sheep farms across England and Wales. 82% of those sheep farms um, had um, resistant fluke um, on them when we tested them. And just to give you an idea um, of how resistant these parasites can be, these are the results from uh, 13 farms, uh, sheep farms from the northwest of England. Um, so the farms are A, A, A to M, and we do a pre-treatment faecal egg count, so dung check, uh, and then do a post-treatment dung check three weeks later. And we calculate the percentage reduction uh, in the egg count and for a truly susceptible population, we would expect the reduction to be at least 90%. And actually, we would expect it to be between 95 and 100%. So you can see with these five farms here, the percentage reduction was only between 79% and 25%. So in other words, these all showed evidence of partial resistance. If you then look at these eight farms down here, um, you can see that the drug, in effect, had no if effect on the egg count at all. So in this uh, farm, the, the egg count stayed more or less the same post-treatment. And in these farms, the egg count actually went up post-treatment. So this is suggesting um, that the drug has no effect whatsoever on the parasites in those animals, which is a very um, concerning uh, state of affairs. So can we improve control of fluke? and at the same time reduce the risk of um, resistance spreading? Um, and can we use the veterinary medicines which are available to us? Can we use those uh, more effectively? So this has been very much um, the focus of our research over the last few years. So as a result of a lot of work, working with um, a lot of farmers around the country, um, we've come up with four basic recommendations uh, to try and improve uh, liver fluke control. So our first recommendation is to diagnose presence of infection um, before treatment. And I'll come back and go into a little bit more detail um, uh, for each of these recommendations in a minute. 
Secondly, um, it's important that farmers think about their grazing choices um, and think about preventing contamination of pasture with fluke eggs at the start of the season, so in the spring. Thirdly, um, we suggest it's important to find out um, if there is any resistance on your farm. And then secondly, um, um, ideally, um, uh, develop a plan so that you don't bring resistant parasites onto your farm uh, when you buy in stock. And then fourthly, think carefully about the choice of veterinary medicine. Um, so what we're suggesting is that different products which affect different stages of the parasite should be used at different times of the year, depending on what stage of the parasite is present in the animal uh, at that time of year. So as I say, I'm going to go into a bit more detail in each, into each of these uh, in the next few minutes. So thinking about diagnosis, first of all, I think, I think it's common practice um, not to try and diagnose fluke before animals are treated. And because we don't know exactly when challenge occurs, um, it's very hard, therefore, to tailor treatment so it targets the parasite once it's present in the animal. Having said that, diagnosis is not straightforward either, and um, it's certainly not um, perfect. So your options for diagnosis are uh, mainly lab tests. So first of all, a dung check, a faecal egg count, an FEC. Um, so a lot of the work we've done has um, been aimed towards looking at the to, to statistically validating composite ca counts. So this reduces um, the effort involved in collecting samples and also the cost involved in testing lots of individual samples. So with faecal egg counts, uh, we know that um, um, making a composite sample from 10 animals um, and then checking that, that, some, that single composite sample for eggs is a good indication of the presence of the parasite in a group of animals. Another test which is used frequently is the copper antigen test. This is, this is not useful in um, composite samples, but it's useful for individual animals. So if you took 10 samples of dung and sent those away, uh, each individual sample would be tested. The problem with a dung check looking for eggs or indeed copper antigen is that that only picks up adult parasites and it takes about between 10 to 12 weeks, so nearly three months after infection for those eggs to be present in the dung of infected animals. The, the, a dung check will not detect immature parasites. So the only test we have really that tests that picks up immature parasites is a blood test, which detects antibody to the parasite. Um, and we, we suggest that the best use of the blood test is with uh, samples taken from first season grazing animals. So either first season calves um, or lambs, either lambs, uh, fat lambs or ewe replacement lambs and sample those in the autumn. Um, and that gives us a good measure of um, whether an animal has been exposed to the parasite or not. And what we're trying to do with uh, funding from um, AHDB and more recently BBSRC is to develop a, a penicide test that farmers can use themselves uh, with a drop of blood from an ear prick, for example, and run a lateral flow test. So it's based on um, the human um, pregnancy diagnosis test. It's the same basic uh, technology. So that, so that farmers can test animals themselves to determine whether they need to be tested or they need to be treated or not. And then the other thing to remember is that abattoir returns and bulk tank tests on dairy farms um, can be useful in just determining whether you do have uh, fluke present in the group or not. So our second re recommendation is around grazing management. Um, so so we've shown um, using a variety of different approaches that uh, if sheep are treated, uh, sheep and cattle, sheep, sheep and all cattle are treated in the spring uh, to prevent eggs going out onto the pasture. This reduces the level of infection in the snail uh, and reduces the number of cysts produced on the pasture at the, at, at the end of the summer. 
Um, again, we'd suggest that cattle uh, and sheep are tested in the spring to see if they are shedding eggs. So again, the composite uh, fecal egg count could be tested or the copper antigen test. And then if they are positive, um, use a test, use a treatment which targets adult flu because there are adult flu present in the animals at this time. So use a medicine that targets that stage of flu in the animals. And then just thinking further about grazing choices, um, as I've mentioned, liver fluke develops in uh, these tiny mud snails uh, and the parasite cysts are released from the snails and stick to the vegetation um, and the grass vegetation that the, that the animals then eat. So you can see in this picture here, this is uh, one of our lab snails actually, uh, it's the same, the same species that we find in the field. And you can see these little white dots of the parasite actually emerging from the snail and these swim off uh, and go and insist on the vegetation. So the development of the parasite occurs within the snail over the summer months. So the, the snails are infected by the parasite uh, in the spring um, and then the parasite emerges from the snails in the autumn. And that means that the, the highest risk of infection with liver fluke uh, for, for, for grazing sheep and cattle is in the autumn, so September and October typically. So if it's possible, um, avoid high risk pasture in the autumn. So what do we mean by high risk pasture? Actually, what I should say is um, it's really important to remember that fluke is a seasonal disease and that's because infection occur in the snail, the development of the parasite in the snail over the summer uh, results in infection on the pasture in the autumn and that's when challenge um, to the animals occurs. So what do we mean by high risk um, pasture? So a high risk pasture is one which, um, which contains perfect snail habitat. So perfect snail habitat is wet, damp, but not underwater. So these are not uh, aquatic snails, these are amphibious snails. So they live on the margins of water bodies. The, the Snails like bare mud uh, because uh, they feed on algae which grows on the surface of mud. So that mud uh, needs to be um, uh, um, uh, suitable for the growth of algae. So ideally not recently um, poached uh, and not recently disturbed. And then the mud should also be open, so not shaded by hedges or trees or long vegetation, because again, the algae needs sunlight to grow. Um, so open, um, uh, uh, undisturbed mud is, uh, create, is an ideal habitat for the snail. So such areas uh, within pasture include things like uh, even just very shallow depressions caused by tractors and other vehicles um, going through fields. Any poaching, um, uh, historic poaching by animals which leaves a little um, uh, depression. Um, which collects water um, and where there's bare mud. Natural landscape features such as um, uh, 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 drains or, or streams uh, and so on. Drainage ditches provide, especially if they've been recently cleared, so you've got those beautiful bare muddy sides, ideal conditions for um, liver fluke. Um, and then banks on the sides of streams or ponds or, um, for example, soft ground around leaking water taps or pipes, providing that it's not heavily poached. Those all provide ideal conditions for snails. OK, so our third um, area for um, control is to check for resistance. As I said before, resistance to products containing the drug triclobendazole is common in the UK. Um, we've shown that in Wales and, and England, but it's also very common in Northern Ireland and Scotland. So it's important uh, if you use triclobenazole routinely to test your, uh, your sheep or your cattle um, to see if there's any evidence of resistance. So the best method uh, to use is the composite faecal egg count reduction test, um, the CFECRT, um, which we do with 20 sheep. Um, and at Liverpool, we can offer that test. So there's some contact details here um, if you're interested in us running that test. 
So related to resistance um, is the need to quarantine test uh, and check animals which are brought in. So we've shown uh, by working with a number of farms that there are certainly farms that don't have fluke in their animals, but they did have snail habitats on their farms and that snail habitat was um, occupied by mud snails. So in other words, there's potential um, <coughs> on those farms for the parasite to become established. And we've also shown that buying in animals is a risk factor for fluke on farms. So if you're buying in animals, uh, not only is there a risk of being, bringing the actual parasite onto your farm, but perhaps more importantly for those farms that already have the parasite, there's the risk of bringing resistant parasites onto your farm as well. Um, and we shouldn't forget tups when we think about buying in animals. I mean, yes, we can think about um, replacement ewes, um, heifers and so on, but actually tups often get, are, are, are brought in regularly and often get forgotten about. So it's important to test and treat animals before they join the main herd or flock. Uh, and ideally, it's uh, suggested that, an, that any bought in animals should either be housed or turned out onto a dry field where there is no fluke habitat until they've been tested. And if they're positive, then treat them. But ideally, don't use a, pa don't use, um, a product which contains uh, triclobendazole. Choose another product such as um, Clasantel uh, to treat those animals to avoid the risk of resistant parasites coming in uh, and becoming established onto your farm. So I've talked a lot about treatment and uh, what we'd like to do is reduce the reliance on just repeated blanket treatment um, and particularly frequent use of triclobendazole. There's a lot of paras there's a lot of products on the market, uh, but there is a, a relatively small number of active ingredients within each of those products. And each of the active ingredients will target a different stage of the parasite. And if you remember, this is a seasonal par parasite, so challenge occurs in the autumn. So we, we know what the majority of stages are in an animal um, at, any one, um, uh, at any one particular time. So it's important um, to choose a product uh, containing an active ingredient uh, which, which targets the age of fluke in your animals at that particular time. Be aware that none of the fluke medicines has a protective effect. So if you treat your animals and turn them back out onto pasture, they can be immediately reinfected if that pasture is contaminated. And we'd also suggest be aware of combination products. There's a lot of products which to treat both roundworm and liver fluke, only use those at the right time of year uh, when you want to target um, both liver fluke and, um, and nematodes and roundworms. But um, this just summarises the active ingredients uh, which can be used uh, to treat liver fluke um, and the range of effects they have, sorry, and their, the effect they have against the different stages of parasites. So triclobendazole will treat any parasite that's more than um, um, two weeks old and in sheep they will kill parasites that are only two days old. Uh, Clisantel will target late immature parasites, seven to eight weeks old. Similarly, nitroxanil will kill parasites that are over eight weeks old. And then Clausulon, Albendazole and Oxyclosinide will all kill adult parasites or parasites about 10 weeks old and beyond. Often the wormers that are used to treat roundworm are not effective against fluke. And there are a limited number of these products. Not all of these products are available in dairy cows. So it's really important to check um, the labels and check with your prescriber uh, whether they can be used in, um, in dairy cows or not. So all of this information is summarised in the Liverpool, um, the Liverpool uh, fluke plan, uh, which is summarised here. So essentially in the spring, uh, test sheep and cattle using faecal egg counts and if, they're, uh, and if they're positive, treat for adult parasites. So use products such as uh, oxyclotinide, albendazole or nitroxanil or chlorcylon. In the summer, test for resistance if, you're, if, you, if you use triclobendazole a lot. 
uh, and ensure you don't buy in resistance. So test adult sheep using the composite fecal egg count reduction test for resistance and then quarantine, test and treat, bought in cattle and sheep and not forgetting tubs. The autumn is the high risk time of year, particularly for acute disease in fluke. So where possible, avoid wet pasture and test and treat for juvenile fluke. Um, so ideally test first season uh, grazing calves and lambs to know when, when infection is occurring. Um, so you can use blood tests for that. Uh, it is possible to test adult stock using faecal egg counts to give you an indication of the presence of fluke. And then at that time of year, treat for the juvenile uh, fluke. So use products containing triclobendazole, uh, assuming you have no resistance, uh, or clisantel if you do have resistance. And then finally in winter, um, think about uh, whether you house your stock um, and then test after housing uh, and before treating. So again, faecal egg counts or the copper antigen can be used. Treat for the late immatures and adult flukes. So for example, use products such as glisantel um, or nitroxamil. Visits or even stuff. Oh, we're going live. We're live. Yeah. Yeah. Um, good evening and thank you for joining us for tonight's question and answer session. Tonight we're joined by Professor Diana Williams of Liverpool University and um, who will be here to answer some questions on liver fluke. So thank you very much Diana for joining us. You're welcome. Um, so, yeah. Brilliant. Um, so first off, um, obviously we've had a very dry spring this year. Um, how do you think that's going to impact on the seasonality of liver fluke? for this current season? Um, yeah, you're absolutely right. It was very dry in April. Um, and um, although it's been a lot wetter since, um, I think that because we had such a dry April, we, we, are, we, we predict that liver flute will be um, delayed in terms of the development of the parasite in the snails over the summer. Um, so because it was so dry, I think maybe quite a lot of snails that have survived the winter may have died off. Um, and those that survived, it probably took them longer to emerge from hibernation or estivation uh, in April and start to build up the population. Um, and until you've got a good snail population, probably um, you haven't got uh, enough snails to be infected uh, with the parasite. So yeah, so we predict that perhaps liver fluke this year um, will be delayed in terms of onset uh, and maybe it will be less severe um, than in really wet years. Okay, perfect. And you've mentioned obviously the mud snail and he's that very important intermediate host. So is there anything out there that farmers can be doing in particular to try and control those mud snails or is there any information you could offer on that particular aspect of things or is there any research ongoing at the moment in terms of that area? Yeah, snail, snails are a real problem, to be honest, because um, there's very little you can do to control snails, um, particularly on farms where there are um, agro-environmental schemes or there are they, they're situated in um, areas of outstanding natural beauty or, or, or other conservation areas, it's, it's really problematic because um, it's not easy to drain land um, and often, especially in Wales, obviously land is extremely wet um, and so draining is often just not feasible at all. Um, certainly many of the farms we've worked on in Wales, they tend to have such extensive wet areas that it's almost impossible to fence off those areas and keep stock away from areas where there is snail habitat. Um, snail habitat can be very um, um, sort of scattered through a pasture. It's often very diffuse, it's often ephemeral, so it's, you know, it's not there all the time. So it's really difficult to fence off or try and control the snails in any way. The only thing I would say is that 
the parasite is released from snails in the autumn. So um, it, always think that the autumn is the high risk time of year. So that's the time of year to try and avoid the wettest pastures. Um, and I know a lot of the farms who we work with in Cumbria, for example, where they have a lot of fluke, it's very wet. Um, they actually house their sheep in the in the autumn, really because okay. that avoids um, uh, sort of them the, the sheep grazing contaminated heavily contaminated pastures. Obviously, that doesn't work for everybody, but it's an option that people might want to think about if they're on really wet farms. Okay. Yeah. Absolutely perfect. So then I'm guessing we've mentioned like the mud snail and things. So one element or one something that to consider would be diagnostics and testing. So you have spoken about in your presentation tonight about the importance of testing. Um, and you did mention a new lateral flow that you've been working on or trying to develop. Um, do you have any more information about that for anyone who might be interested? Um, yes. So di diagnostics, fluke diagnostics, um, we think are really important. Um, it's a really good way of targeting um, treatment at animals once they become infected, rather than kind of just guessing as to whether they're infected or not. Um, and none of the diagnostic tests are perfect. So a diagnostic test that farmers can actually just do themselves um, there and then, you know, when they gather in a sheep, do a test that straight away and then you can make the decision whether to treat or not based on that diagnostic test to us seems to be um, a logical way forward so we have had funding from um, a range of organizations um, to help us to develop the test um, we're just about to start working with a company to start um, scaling up the production of the tests um, and probably the, over the next year or so, um, we'll start to uh, do some field trials um, to see, you know, A, does it work? Um, it, the prototype works, but does, you know, once we scale it up, does it work effectively? And uh, is it something that farmers want to use? And then in terms of field trials and things, will that be experimentally infected animals you look at testing first, or will you be looking at farmers perhaps to get involved with that study and test on farm essentially? These would be very much field tests. I mean, we've already done a lot of work on experimentally infected animals, um, and we've got a lot of archive material that we've used to validate the test. Um, so we really want to get out onto farms. Um, so yes, you may well be receiving calls for help. <laughs> in the, in, in Absolutely the fine. I'm sure we can find some farmers who'd be happy to help. Absolutely. So what we'd, what we'd like to do is to take um, other samples from the animals as well, so that we can compare the results of the lateral flow test, the pen, the pen side test, with the more traditional uh, diagnostic test. So serum antibody and um, uh, dung checks using both egg counts and the copper antigen analyzer. Okay, so you're kind of just looking at what everything is in terms yeah. of how compatible everything is in your final yeah. result in a way. Yeah, Perfect. so it's ground truthing the test really. Yeah. 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 And then um, obviously triclobenazole is the product of choice, um, but as you've mentioned, resistance is apparent and becoming very common across um, England and especially in Wales and Scotland. Um, is there, are the other products on the market, are they, is there resistance known for those products that are used to treat fluke as well, or is it mainly triclobenazole resistance you're seeing out there? So the only, the only type of resistance that we have had definitely confirmed in the UK is uh, triclobenazole resistance. Um, so other um, active uh, ingredients in drugs include things like Clasantel, uh, which is present in Flukiva, for example. So Flukiva is a good alternative to use um, um, instead of uh, triclobendazole, if you know you have resistance. Um, uh, so, so as far as we're aware, there has been no reports of resistance to Clasantel in the UK. There have been reports of resistance in other parts of the world, um, but and there've been some. There's been a couple of cases in the UK uh, of suspected placental resistance, but we've investigated those uh, by putting the parasite into sheep 
and then treating them with Pasantel. Um, as far as we can tell, they those parasites were not resistant uh, to Pasantel, uh, which is which is good. Um, so it's it's important yeah. to maintain the efficacy of Pasantel. Uh, yeah, yeah. And then um, we've got one question in there from a particular farm here. They have um, suspected trichobendal trichobenzol resistance on farm based on their previous history. So how best would, would they go about trying to treat the immature fluke in that particular case? Okay, so I think, well, first of all, it's really good to confirm trichobenzol resistance if you suspect it. So using the composite fecal egg count reduction test um, is a good way uh, to confirm that resistance. And then if you know you definitely have resistance, then you can put together a plan um, using different drugs at different times of year. So in the autumn, when we know there are immature fluke in the animals, use something like Flukiva, which targets um, a proportion of the immature fluke, not all of them, but a proportion of them. Um, so that's a good drug to use. At, so things like it's present in um, uh, Flukiva, um, uh, uh, Solantel, things like that. Um, so use that drug in the autumn, but then in the later winters, try and go for other products which contain different active ingredients, such as nitroxanil or EVA or oxyclozonide, uh, which is present in Xanil, for example, um, where you can start to treat the adult fluke and you save the drugs which keep kill the immature flu just to use those in the autumn. So use different drugs at different times of year, depending on the stage of fluke present in the animal at that particular time of year, if that makes sense. Okay, yeah, that makes absolute sense. So I'm guessing those particular farms out there that potentially do have a suspected problem or suspected resistance, um, they just probably need to liaise and come up with that plan with their vet and get that written up into their animal health plan, essentially. And, and then and you can follow, you, oh, you can the Liverpool flu control plan. It sort of, it sets that out about what drugs you use at what time of year. And perfect, yeah. yeah. And then um, how would you go about tr um, trying to make the most of triclobenzol, for example? So how would you go about ensuring you don't develop resistance on your, on your farm? Um, so the key things are, first of all, um, diagnose the presence of infection before you treat. Um, so I'll give you an example of a farm that we um, did some work, this was actually in Scotland. So he brought, he had 2000 sheep, brought them down off the hills and he wanted to treat them. It was um, sort of August, late August. And he wanted to treat them with triclobenazole because, or with Facinex because that's what he always did. So he said, well, test them first. So he took some blood samples, tested them. They were all negative. So he said, don't, don't treat them. So he didn't treat them. So that meant that his three farm workers could carry on with the harvest. They got in their harvest, their grain harvest before the weather broke. He didn't need to treat his, his sheep and he reckoned it saved him 26,000 pounds, which is quite impressive really. So yeah, exactly. Yeah, so in other words, diagnose infection before you treat and only use triclobendazole in the autumn, uh, which is when you would want to target the immature fluke. So your blood test in a proportion of um, uh, animals, ewe lambs or um, fur season grazing cars, test those, that will tell you whether the challenge has occurred. Use triclobendazole at that time of year. And then after that, don't use triclobendazole again use something which targets the later stages. Okay, perfect. So, yeah, so it's just a case of trying to figure out where you're at with the life cycle stages and what product would work best, essentially. Um, we have had a question from the audience now, um, so bear with me, it's quite a long one. Um, would a condemned liver be a sign of current fluke infection or a previous infection if the lamb had been treated with flucicide over a month prior to slaughter? Um, would the liver heal and how quickly would it heal? So that's um, just coming from the audience. Okay, um, so, so livers certainly do um, regenerate and recover, but it probably takes, um, it, it probably takes weeks and it will depend on how many fluke have actually 
infected that liver. Um, so even when you treat an animal, um, there will still be damage to the liver. And usually when you get the report back from the abattoir, it may say historic fluke. Um, uh, so that might give you an indication that it's just fluke damage as, a flu as opposed to active fluke, which usually tells you there is current infection. Okay, so if you look at, dig into the abattoir ret returns in a bit more detail, it'll give you some indication of, um, uh, of whether it's historic infection or current infection. And if it's historic infection, um, then it, it, it will take several weeks for those livers to recover. Yeah. And then if it was um, active infection, I'm guessing then it would be best to recommend that, to that particular farm to perhaps do it sometime form of diagnostic would it be? So either a faecal egg count or a corporal antigen test, or would you have a preference which one they would go for? I think I think either. In our hands, the corporal antigen test and the egg count tests are very similar in how in how they they uh, perform. The only advantage of, a, of an egg count, you can use a composite sample. Um, so, so that you just do a single count on say, uh, dung samples from 10, 10 cattle or sheep, which makes it slightly cheaper. The copper okay. antigen test, you have to do it on individual animals. Um, it, the, the composite test doesn't work very well with the copper antigen test. Uh, but to be honest, either of them are, 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 are good to use. It's much better to use any test than no test. Yes. Um, so I definitely do some, um, some diagnostics. The other thing is if, um, if he had treated, if, if this guy had treated um, and he was still getting reports of active infection, uh, it depends what he treated with and when he treated, but again, it might be worth thinking about doing a resistance test if he's still yes. getting active fluke. And um, okay, so we've obviously mentioned the importance of products and things. Um, is there any new products coming onto the market that you're aware of, or do we really have to look after the ones we currently have? So I think we have to look after the ones we currently have. Um, it, as, as far as I'm aware, <clears throat> there are no new, completely new active ingredients coming onto the market. Uh, I know there's lots of research going on, but all of all that research is quite a long way from actual actual market ready commercial products. Um, uh, and similarly, I think the vaccine um, work is also still a way off having a, um, a, a vaccine which is effective um, against fluke. Okay, perfect. Uh, we have a, had another question now from the audience again. Um, this person is looking to know whether or not um, that cyst um, can stay present in silage or does it kill it off? Or do we know the answer? Yeah, yeah we do actually. Uh, one of our PhD students has just finished a project looking at how long uh, the cysts survive in, halid, in silage. Um, so, so all the work she's done this is Bethan, Bethan John. She, she's um, looked at survival of cysts in um, silage that's been stored anaerobically. So in other words, properly made silage. Um, and basically all the cysts have died after two weeks. So okay. in anaerobically stored silage, the cysts die within two weeks. And that's whether uh, it's sort of 20%, 30% or 40% dry matter. If you've got spoiled silage or, or silage which is exposed to the air, to oxygen, then the cysts um, survive for a bit longer. They probably survive for up to 10 weeks in, in spoiled silage. So, so the message, certainly the SCOPS mes message is make silage properly. <laughs> okay. um, and that so some very promising results there and yeah. Yeah. it's a yeah. good story basically. Exactly. So if you've got well-made silage, then the cyst will not survive. Yeah. Okay, great. And um, one of your slides covered, you covered biosecurity and the importance of treating. Um, so in your opinion, um, how long before you could introduce new cattle or sheep into your own flock or herd post-treatment um, for liver fluke or what would you treat with as well? Um, so if you could just give us a little roundup of what's best for biosecurity. Okay, so, so biosecurity is really problematic. Um, it's not easy. Um, and it's really quite hard to give hard and fast advice. Okay. Um, because, I mean, in an ideal world, if you buy in uh, some stock, 
then put them somewhere, either house them, put them on a yard or put them on a dry field um, where you know there's no snails, uh, if you have such a thing, um, put them there, test them. So take a dung sample, send it off to be checked. If it comes back positive, then treat those animals with something like um, Flukiva or Trodax or something like that. The problem is that we know that fluke eggs can be retained in the liver for two or three weeks. So you can treat them and if you turn them straight out onto pasture with the, with the rest of the flock or the herd um, and, it's, and the snails on that pasture, there is a risk that a small number of eggs might still get onto the pasture. But trying to keep stock housed or on dry pasture for probably you know, four to six weeks in total before they join the main herd or flock is really difficult. And frankly, it's very often not feasible. Um, so, so I think the important thing is, therefore, if, you know, if, that, if that's really difficult to do, try and get some information on where those animals have come from. Have they come from farms that have fluke? Uh, have they been treated uh, before they come to your farm? Um, is there any evidence of resistance on those farms that they're coming from? So again, we worked with, with a, a beef farm in Oxfordshire and they had trichobendazole resistance on their farm. And yet they don't, they rarely use trichobendazole, but, but they were buying in actually okay. from Wales. So I think they were buying in resistant parasites. So it's, it's, it's try and get as much information as you can talk to your vet about it, about what's best for you and for your farm and what will work for one farm won't necessarily work for your neighbouring farm. So, so you really have to sort of talk it through and think it through with, you, with your vet ideally. Yeah, um, so unfortunately it's not a one size fits all in this situation. Absolutely. absolutely. So, so a, a herd health plan is really important. Yeah. Yeah. So again, it's, these discussions need to be perhaps happening with your vet during your animal health planning. And um, Diana, is there any um, forecast out there to predict the level of liver fluke we'll be seeing this autumn or anything? This is a question we've just had come in from the audience again. Um, yes, there is. Um, there are um, fluke forecasts which are produced by Nardis, uh, which are freely available. If you go to the Nardis website, N-A-D-I-S, I can send you a link, yeah. um, or you probably already have a link. Um, so they produce um, uh, forecasts. It's actually somebody, it's one of my colleagues at Liverpool who, who does those forecasts. Um, Scops and Cows, who are the two industry advisory groups, one for sheep and one for cattle, we produce a joint monthly newsletter. Um, we'll probably produce one in early September. And again, we'll highlight um, the likely risk of fluke uh, for this coming season. And um, the only issue with all of those forecasts is that they are not terribly local. So they work at a regional level. So it'll be a forecast virtually for the whole of Wales, which is not okay. ideal. Yeah. Uh, so again, we have, we have another project um, going, ongoing, which is trying to develop a sort of a much, a, a kind of farm specific forecast um, to try and guide people um, as to when to test and when to treat, but that's, um, that's research. That's a research project you currently have ongoing. Yeah, yeah, it's an innovate fund, innovate UK funded project. So yeah, yeah, with a company uh, called Farming Online, which do a lot of crop forecasts, and sl they actually do a slug watch forecast. Okay, so, uh, we use the same kind of technology to produce, um, um, hopefully, a, a fluke forecast, which will be on online. It'll come to your your phone, a mobile phone app type of thing. And how far along are we into that project or research wise or when should we be expecting these forecasts to be more live or active? Okay, so, so we're kind of aiming for about six months, fingers crossed. Okay. Yeah. Um, that's the plan. Okay, so watch this space, but okay. fingers crossed we'll have something in six months. Yeah. Um, okay, so I think we'll take our final question now for the night. Um, do you know or is there any genetic resistance um, in livestock to liver fluke? So are there known to be any particular breeds or anything that have more resilience to liver fluke than others? Um, we don't know of any obvious resistance at, at a breed level. Um, certainly there are differences at individual animal levels in that some animals appear to be 
you know, much more susceptible than other individual animals. And there are there is a fair amount of work going on looking at both um, intra-breed um, variation. So within a breed, is there variation within individual animals and also interbreed, so between breed uh, resistance. Um, there's been some work done in Ireland, um, which have looked at um, some breeds of sheep, uh, texels, but it it's fairly small scale. So there's nothing, um, we don't have anything concrete. Um, okay. They, yes, this breed is more susceptible or, or less susceptible um, than another breed. Um, it's something we've discussed with um, the Innovis um, people looking at the ABBA breed to see whether we can look at, start to look at resistance to liver flu, but we don't really have any data at this stage. Okay, so at the moment it's all a bit guesswork in a way. Yeah. So no solid research at the moment, but yeah. maybe yeah. in a few years this yeah. is something that we can maybe readdress or look at. Um, so thank you for answering all those questions. I think that was very useful. And thank you all for listening and joining us at home. Um, so if you have missed any part of tonight's webinar or question and answer session, um, it will be available on our Facebook page and also on our web page um, after this event. Um, our next webinar is taking place on Tuesday the 1st of September. So if you are interested in looking at um, our new Hill Breeding Index, we will be joined by Sam Boone and Janet, Dr. Janet Roden. So please join us then to discuss it. So thank you very much, everyone, and see you soon.